Hey there, and welcome into the show. This show, of course, hopefully, is the one that you meant to click on, which is a Level Deeper podcast. I am Chad, and since I'm going to be the one hosting this conversation, you can call me the host of the show. It's great to be with you again. This is my, I think, second or third recording in a row that I'm recording from my grandmother's house. My wife, Eileen, and I, as you may or may not know, we live full-time in a van and we travel, but for the last five months or so, We have been back in Michigan, which is our home state, and uh, we've been kind of bouncing around, staying different places, living in a van in the wintertime in Michigan is not ideal and really not what we built it for. So anyway, our dog Sadie had ACL surgery about a week ago, and so we've been staying at my grandmother's house, and it's been really special. Like I said, this is now my second or third episode that I've recorded from her house, and you know the experience of being here. Have you ever stayed for a week or 10 days at your grandparents' house? This is the first time that, that we have, and it's been really meaningful. It's been really special getting to just spend time with her and have conversation and have dinner together every night. And so anyway, if you happen to be watching this, that is my backdrop here. <laughs> I've had people ask, where, where are you? What, 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 is, what is going on here? This is my grandmother's. Anyway, recently my, my grandma asked me, about this show and this podcast. She had listened to the episode with my mom and she was kind of like, why do you do that? <laughs> and what what ensued in my answer was an answer that I'm actually going to share in this conversation today. My guest on the show is Tanner Olson. Tanner goes by Written to Speak on Instagram. Maybe you've seen some of his writings or some of the things that he shares. It's beautiful. And uh, I share with that with him at the end of this conversation about how much I appreciate his writing. And at its heart, Tanner is a creator. And as I consider myself a fellow creator, these are the conversations that I love. I love sitting down having a discussion with someone about the process of creating and and how he got started with his writing and his poetry, what the process has been like for him to turn that hobby or that passion, or as he says, that invitation. We talk about why he uses that word in particular. This invitation to become a writer, how he's turned that into a variety of things that have become his full-time work. Oh my gosh, it was like therapeutic. We had a conversation about this need to create, and sometimes I have a hard time articulating this. It is the need that I feel like I have inside of me to create something like the show and Tanner expressed what that need feels like inside of him as well. And so maybe you feel that need or that calling to create something and whether it's poetry like Tanner, he also has a podcast of his own called Walk a Little Slower, a podcast like this, whatever it is that you might be itching, feeling like you're needing to create, I think you're going to benefit from that part of the show. Tanner shares his perspective on the one word that people who want to become anything need to drop from their vocabulary. I found it really insightful and something that I'm going to continue carrying with me into my life. And we talked about Tanner's faith and the role that that plays in his life in general, and especially his life as a creator. This was just a really, really fun conversation. Tanner even kind of took the mic in the middle of it and asked me a few questions, which I really enjoyed. Just a great back and forth conversation. A couple of friends, well, now friends at the time when we started recording this episode, we didn't know each other at all. And that's kind of the beautiful thing about this show is that we enter as strangers, we leave as friends and two people who have now a shared experience and shared perspectives. And yeah, it's really special. So anyway, this is my conversation with Tanner Olson. I hope you enjoy it. How many of these have you done on the interviewee side of things? By the way, congratulations on 100 episodes. Oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's the pod. <laughs> my, <laughs> I don't know what to say. You're the first person to congratulate me. Everyone else is just like, yeah, we listened to it. Uh, but it's been it's I fun. Mean, it's it's a that, weird. That's a big milestone. I I think so. I you know honestly, it kind of snuck up on me. Uh, but it, it's it's a fun thing. It's a the, the podcasting world is a weird world it's a weird space i have 
done the thing where I'm consistent and now I'm doing the inconsistent thing where I'm like, this could be an episode. And then I just, here it is. Uh, it's just kind of like a fun side hobby to go along with multiple other side hobbies. Um, but it's fun. The, the, um, like the messages you receive out of the things that you share, uh, which is just, I think that's the thing that matters to me. It's, uh, offering words, uh, to people who are searching for the, the words, but yeah, a hundred episodes and, uh, We'll see if we do any more than that. Was just every every week, it's like maybe we'll do a podcast. <laughs> so good for you for being like, this is the thing I'm doing. I'm sticking with it. It matters, and I'm just like, I my our, so our world got flipped upside down uh, like three months ago. We were in the process of adoption of adopting, and then we got a phone call, and then we welcomed our son home. And so for the last three months, it's just been like go 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 in the most wonderful way. But I have felt. Uh, and maybe you know what this is like as a creative where you just feel behind. I'm somebody who I like to have like a week ahead, two weeks ahead where I have space to think. And now it's not so much space to think. It's just I need to sh create something and, and share it uh, and offer it to the world. Uh, so I'm kind of feeling that right now. That's why when I'm talking about the podcast, I'm like, yeah, we'll, we'll see. It might happen. It, it will, but we'll see what actually happens with it. So. Yeah. How do you sort of process or deal with, and by the way, at this point, we're just, we're just into the conversation. So we're just going to keep going. Uh, oh, I think it favorite, favorite kind of podcasts are the ones that like, there's no actual start. It's just going. Yeah. How do you, as a creator, how do you sort of deal with or process that feeling of feeling behind? What does that bring up for you and how are you working through that? I think there's a, so there's a difference between feeling behind in, in life and there's a, a feeling behind in work I, there and feeling behind in, in life where like you see all your friends, uh, family members or whoever it may be, be at this point in their lives. And you're thought, Oh, I thought I would be there by now. Or I thought I would be, you know, I thought I'd be married, have a family, be working this job, have a house, like whatever it may be. Uh, that feeling is that feeling kind of feels paralyzing and suffocating. Um, Whereas like feeling behind in work, that feels it. I've, I've gotten to this point, but it, it feels more of like an invitation to surrender and be like, okay, like it's okay to feel like you're doing the best you can with what you have. And although this is a new feeling, this isn't a bad feeling. Because like I said before, like I used to like be a week or two ahead. And so I'd have the space and this freedom to create. And so now it's like learning or retraining my my body, my mind to just enter into it and say, well, just now create from, from this starting point rather than the old starting point. So I don't know. It's, I think as a, as a creative person, we, I mean, you as well, we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to make the thing, do the thing. And we forget that the, the, the doing, the creating is the gift itself. Uh, and so to learn to, to enjoy that again, you know, so that, that's that's what I think. What does surrender mean to you or look like to you? Because this is a word that comes up often. I, I do coaching work with uh, someone I, I had on the podcast, and we'll we'll often talk about this idea of surrender. And I'll I'll say to him, I'm just like, you know, that's a word I hear all the time, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure I have any idea what it means or how to apply it <laughs> to my life. So I, I'm I'm asking for a friend here. I'm trying to figure <laughs> out what does surrender mean to you, and maybe I can apply something to my life. Uh, well, I think it depends on like on who or what, what who you're what who or what you are surrendering to, and what it is you are surrendering. So I think for me, uh, I follow Jesus. So for, it's like I surrender myself to the Lord, and then work out of that place. And what I am surrendering is essentially the invitation uh, to create. Like, you know, uh, I don't know if you're like a church guy at all, but there's a lot of talk about like calling uh, of like, I feel like I was called into this or to do this. And I like to say, like, I feel like this is the thing that I was invited to do. Like, we're all created differently. We're all created beautifully. What is the thing that you think that you were created to do? And then you kind of live into that invitation. And for me, that's like writing, it's poetry, it's telling stories, it's podcasting. Uh, and so to surrender that and it just allows me to enjoy it again. 
be like, if, if all of this is a gift, why am I putting so much pressure on myself? Like it, it makes me not enjoy the gift and the gift is life, right? Like, so just like surrender, man, like breathe, exhale. Uh, and I think the hard part is uh, all of the, uh, the things that I'm really good at, which is like distracting myself with social media, comparing myself to others online, like, oh, you, you're doing that, or this is happening for your career, or you got this book deal, or you're doing this. Uh, and instead to surrender, to let go, to open up my hands and just be like, hey, I'm just doing the best I can with what I have, and it's not gonna look like it does for that person the way it looks for me. Uh, and then just to exhale, spend a lot of time exhaling. <laughs> Because I am just strapped with stress. <laughs> I'm just okay. I this is all good. It's all good. You know. Does that make sense? I just kind of rambled, but that, did that check out? Is it like a? Yeah, I mean, is it like a an element of surrendering? Are you surrendering control? Are you letting go of control? I guess this oh, is yeah. when I try to wrap my brain around it a little bit. I'm, um, you know, I'm like, okay, what, where do I draw the line between surrendering some of my inputs versus surrendering? the expected outputs. And I seem to have latched on a little bit to like, well, I can control the inputs that I put into things, the things that I create, I can control my intention. What I'm Mm -hmm. working on surrendering, I guess, or what it means to me is letting go of trying to control the outputs of my inputs. Are you kind of seeing it similar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you, you create the thing, you give the thing, and then how that thing is received. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I got no answer for you because I'm trying to figure that out too. I think it's, uh, and I I don't, I don't think it's helpful to say, well, just go about it blindly. I don't think that's really helpful. I think it's important to kind of see if the thing that you're creating is, is sticking or if it's helpful. Um, but then I, it's a, to not get hung up on that or to get hung up on the, on the numbers or to measure the impact. I don't think it's like measuring impact. It, I don't think we can do that. Uh, because also the thing that you put out today may not hit somebody for four years. You know, it's, it's wild the, the number of things that I have posted and shared that are then found years after they were posted and shared. And it meant somebody, it meant something to somebody in that moment years later. And so it is like believing and trusting that the thing that I am doing matters, whether it matters the moment I post it or share it or offer it or years down the road. Um, so that's, I don't know, that's kind of what I would say, but you can't, I love, I love the idea of control. I wish I could control things. Yeah. But I can't, I can't, it's, it's not for me. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you still find yourself getting caught in the trap of trying to measure the impact of the things that you create? Yeah, I, I think I want to exhaust all of my effort in doing so. Uh, in, in the past, like when I first got started as a writer, I would, and this was like back in the days of blogging, which I still blog. I still, I still think it's a thing. But like I would write the, I would write it and I'd be excited about it. And I would share the link on Facebook or Twitter. And it would, either get no hits or like one or two. And I just thought, oh, you, you failed, you bombed. It was no good. And I didn't realize that, you know, not everybody's that follows you or cares about your work is seeing the one thing that you're putting out, you know? So it's like, you can't really control who is seeing it, how they're seeing it, when they're seeing it, but you can share that thing like again or differently. And I think that's kind of, that, that's the thing for me that changed. Like you can share the same thing multiple times and not just like the first time you post it, you know? Yeah, uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I want to go back to, I, I'm always, I, I listen to people's verbiage and the words that they use and I find it really interesting. So the the word in particular that you chose in this conversation is the word invitation. And instead of something like a calling, um, how did you sort of discern or recognize this invitation to write and to create? What did that feel like for you? If 
when I wake up in the morning, it's the thing that I, I, I am drawn to that I can't help but do. Like when I wake up, like the first thing I want to do is I want to just like sit down and write and put things out. I think the, the, I feel most alive when I am creating, when I am writing, I feel, uh, I feel this like sense of, of wholeness when I'm taking the thoughts and the words inside my head and trying to make sense of them on a piece of paper. And then there's this connection with others, uh, that in the things that I have shared, created, written, where they're like, Hey, that, that mattered to me, that meant something to me. And it's not like this, it's not like this, like, uh, I'm not puffing up my ego, right? Like that, that, that's not the thing that like, it just, I, I, I want to help and invite people into the beauty of hope, uh, and to rest in that. Uh, and I think, and maybe you feel the same way too, as a, as a creator, like we often, I think we create the things that we think are missing in the world or the things that we wish were available to us. Um, I remember when I first started getting into poetry, uh, it was the, the, I didn't even know this was a thing you could do. I didn't know you could be like a poet, but I, I mean, anybody can just be one. You can like, you can just start. It's not like a, in the NBA where you get drafted into it. Like I couldn't just like go show up to a, an arena and be like, I, I am a basketball player as well. I would like to play today. That's not how it works. But with like, with like poetry, man, you can just, you can just start. Like you can just say today I'm a poet and you can do, do some poems and that's it. You're a poet. Like that's how it is. And the first po poet I ever saw his name was Anis Mojgani. He's uh, the, the poet laureate in uh, Oregon right now. And he is just like the most, has the most beautiful like way of delivering words. But I was at this event. I was, it's my sophomore year of college. And he was, he did this event down in Orlando called Heavy and Light, which is through this organization called To Write Love on Our Arms. And he walks out onto the stage and like, he is this, he's like a small, just a small dude, walks up to the microphone, super nonchalant and just is like, and then just shares this poem. And I'm just like, just struck. Like, that's the thing. Like, that's what I, I want to do that. Like, that's, and there's something inside of me that came alive when I saw him do it. And I thought, oh, there's, I can't go through this life and not do that. So I, th I think a little bit of that is the, is that invitation where there's this, there's this spark and it's like, for the first time you're seeing what you can do in this life or what you can do for others in this world. Yeah. Is that check? Checks. Checks. I, feel, <laughs> I feel like after every, everything I say, I'm like, did that make any sense at all? Or did I just spend like three minutes talking, which is kind of, maybe that's like the poet thing. I don't know, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you so far. I'm, I'm absolutely with you. Uh, I want to know about, so you, you, you saw this person on stage and you had this moment of like, yeah. I, I resonate with that. I have a desire to create in a similar type of way. Do you remember the yeah. first poem you ever wrote? The first poem I ever wrote? Yeah. So I have a, yes, I have it in my book, Walk a Little Slower. I have this poem about, because oftentimes when I go and visit uh, schools, like I'll share poetry with classes and uh, they're always like, what's the first poem that you ever wrote? And so I wrote a poem about the first poem that I ever wrote. It's my book titled Walk a Little Slower called Silk and Milk, but the poem ends with, uh, it ends with this line. And the, this life of wondering and writing began in seventh grade when a teenage crush led these words to hit the page. My heart is a flutter as my words trip and stutter, all because her hair is like silk, the color of chocolate milk. So bad. <laughs> but that was it. That was the first poem I ever wrote. But every time I, every time I, you know, I get up and I share poetry with like an audience and they're like, well, where did it all start? Like, how did it all begin? It's, it was bad. It was awful. Like I, I went from seeing this incredible, it was like, it's like going and watch, like seeing Michael Jordan play in the finals and then going home being like, I'm going to play basketball too. And it just be like, not go well. That's exactly how it was for me. When I saw Anis Mojgani deliver that poem, I went home, started writing and 
took me years and years and years to feel like I finally wrote something good. Do you remember what that thing was? The thing that I finally thought was good. Yeah. 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 I have, a, I have a couple that I was like very proud of. Uh, so I've been doing this for 11 years now, but it probably took like two, three, four years before I finally wrote something that I was like, Oh, that's, that, that's, that, that is something that I could read in front of an audience and not be, uh, like feel like I was untrue to myself, you know, like this is me showing up on stage as a poet and also as Tanner Olson. Whereas prior to that, I wrote things where I was like, I'm just trying to be a poet. Whereas I would try to like separate myself from my work. And I don't think that's, that's not how I wanted to uh, go as an artist or as a creative. It's the, uh, the interesting, I think path we sort of all travel if, 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 if we want to create, and by the way, I want to, I want to call note to, for myself and for people listening that you said two, three, four years oh, of yeah. creating things and of writing things until you finally created something that you felt proud of years, mm -hmm. folks. Yeah. It, it takes time, you know? And, um, I, I think about that idea of, I, I forget who, you know, kind of created it or came up with it, but, uh, the, the creator gap or the creative gap where you can, you can recognize what is good creation. You could see that person on stage, you could hear their poetry and you can recognize that's beautiful. I want to create something like that. But then there's that initial gap where your talent and your ability to create something similar, it's just not there yet. So you can recognize what great creation is, but you yourself are not yet capable of doing that. And that is the hardest gap to overcome because you have to go make something and then you have to look at that thing. And because you have the eye, you can say, dang it, this isn't as good as that person. What, what led you to overcome that? Uh, maybe I'm just naive. You know, like, I, I think you got to be a little bit crazy to, well, I think to try to pursue a career as like a poet, you got to be a little off. And I for sure am like, you know, but I, I, I on it, like there's that, but I also like, this is the thing. Like I, there's something in me that was like, you got to do this. Like you got to at least try. And I, and I felt like a, up to that point, like the first couple of years, I was like, I'm trying, but like, I was, I just needed to like build muscle or stamina or find my footing. And I felt like for those first couple of years, like, I was just getting all of these like thoughts and feelings and emotions out of me so that I could finally get to the good stuff. Like there's, there's like so much going on. Like you have to, you have to make some mistakes. Like if you're willing to be bad at something, you might just become good at it. And I was very bad at it. And I was like, but at some point I think you're going to turn a corner. And I, and it just, it just took, I mean, you have to, you have to give the, the, the dream time. Um, when I, when I talk with other artists or creatives, like, I just want to be, I just want to get there. Like, I just want to find my voice or I just want to, you know, I want to be where you're at. And it's like, well, that's not, it just doesn't go, it doesn't happen overnight. Like what's the saying where it's, uh, takes 10 years to become an overnight success. Right. Like, well, that's not encouraging, you know? And, and oftentimes it's like, if you <laughs> like, we, we want this like uh microwave, situation where really like we're we're crock potting it you know like this is a slow cooker it's not going to be ready in 90 seconds like it's going to be ready in a very long time so sit back and stay hungry and i think that's the thing for me is i just kept watching all these other poets and artists and writers doing doing what they were doing and uh, i was encouraged by it I was encouraged by it after I was uh, intimidated by it. Like I was intimidated by how good they were and frustrated that I was not yet good at the thing that I wanted to be good at and then encouraged to keep going. Um, and th that's the hard part. I think, you know, the, you have to, every day you wake up and you start again. Uh, you keep trying, you keep trying, uh, but also learning to, 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 to try with like open hands instead of closed fists, 
where you're just like, you know, you're offering it. You're not just like shoving it or pushing it. Uh, and I think that that was the hard part. Uh, that still is the hard part. I think that takes us back to that idea of surrendering, you know, offering it, oh, offering it with open hands and, and, and just giving something out into the world. You know, I, I really resonate with, as you talk about this sort of innate need to create, I resonate with that a lot. I was the other day, uh, I'm actually right now staying with my grandmother and she's 80 years old. And the other day she was asking me, she was trying to understand sort of like what this podcast is. And she's kind of like, so why, why do you do that? <laughs> uh, and you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of funny. Sometimes it just takes a simple question and, and it, it makes you think and, you, and you're like, well, how do I articulate this to my 80 year old grandmother about why I do this thing where I go and record these hour long conversations with people and I make zero money doing any of it, but it lights this spark in me. And how do I communicate this need that I have to put something meaningful into the world. And, you know, I, I tried my best to sort of do it, but I really resonated as, as you talked about putting something into the world that you think is missing. And, and that to me, I think is sort of the foundation of this thing that I've created is I'm just like, you know what? I think there's conversations that I want to have with people that I don't feel like are being yeah. had. And maybe based on some of my life experiences, I could put something into the world, but do you ever find it difficult to sort of describe to people this need to create oh i thought you were going to uh ask to uh tell people what i do for a living which is also very well, difficult that, that but, too <laughs> yeah i've got to imagine that's a little challenging as well oh it's always it's always fun when people don't believe you when you tell them what you do uh but i i i when thinking about what it is that i want to share with the world and in, in, in believing that there is like um a whole uh, it's not like this, uh, oh, it's on me to fill it. I think uh, it's taking ownership of saying, I think that there is something that we can offer here, beginning to do that, and then kind of setting, creating a model for others to say, oh, I can do that too. And not only can I do that too, but I can do it better. Like when I when I go share poetry places or or speak, half the time I'm doing it, or one of the reasons why I do it is because I know that there's somebody in the audience who's going to one day do it better than me. Maybe that, that person has already seen what I do. Maybe they haven't seen it yet. But I know like when I when I go into a school, like I know there are better poets in that third grade classroom than me. Like I just I know it because kids are first of all, like the they're the best writers that we have. But then like even sharing like these evenings of poetry that I've been doing where I share poetry and tell stories. It's like inviting other people who have maybe never seen a poet before be like, well, maybe I can can do that also. Whether they do that for uh, you know, audience or whether they just go home at night and just start writing. Because I think you and I both know that like when you create or when you write, it's like, it's like free therapy, right? It's, it's, it's learning to, to breathe again or to exhale or to surrender, like whatever we want to call it, but it allows us to move forward lighter. Kids, kids are the best writers. Tell me about uh, why you say dude, that. They're so good. Oh, they're so they're so good because they don't they don't care. They care, but they, they don't care what you think. They're just like, yeah, I wrote this. And then they share it. And, and sometimes they drop these like, I wish I could tell you lines that I have heard, but I, my memory is pretty terrible. Uh, but the things that they say and the way that they say them and what they're offering, it's like they almost don't even know how brilliant they are. They approach writing and creating and sharing with with humility and and then oftentimes when they share it there's no like trace of shame or uh desire for there to be this great applause it is just oh yeah i did the assignment this is what i came up with you know there was there's one time i spoke at a school and we did like a writing exercise and a girl and I'll butcher the poem, but she basically was like, nothing rhymes with orange. And that's the way that I feel. And I was like, I am not sure you understand how like emotionally mature that is, you know, or how honest or, or beautiful it is. And so just like, I don't know, to, but, to, but 
but the the thing is is would they have written those things had somebody not shown them that they can write those things right and i think about the same thing with like with your podcast like maybe there's somebody listening or watching and being like well man like chad's chad's doing this i maybe i can do it too you know and so to set the example uh of creating for a future creator that is some that's some important work i think at least i gotta believe it's some important work it gives me uh chills as i'm sitting here because i think that's that's the belief that i carry as well it hasn't always been my belief there was a time in my life where i thought that um I thought that the path that I was on was the right path. And if people weren't <laughs> following a similar path to I was, I thought that they were wrong. And um, this was a, a phase in my life. I call it like my, my millionaire phase. I was in my young 20s and uh, I wanted to go into real estate investing and I wanted to make a lot of money. And I was all about entrepreneurship. You know, I had a full time job, but I'd go work late at night. And I was like, I mean, I sat up on this high horse. And I looked down at my friends and I was like, hey, if you're not, you know, if you're not, in this grind like I am, then you're, you're doing something wrong. And it, it was through a series of, I guess, just learnings and figuring out, you know what, this, this really doesn't feel right. And leaving that job and going and living in my mom's basement for a while and doing landscaping work and painting and a lot of humbling experiences. But I've, yeah, I've come to this conclusion of the, the saying that my wife and I use in all of our writings and all of our materials is, Whatever you do in life, make it meaningful. And to me, that just means I chose to go pursue entrepreneurship. I chose to go live in a van. I chose to start a podcast. I chose to do some of these things. That doesn't have to be your choice. But I hope you choose something to pursue in your life that is meaningful. I like that. I was the perhaps the opposite of you in my 20s, my early 20s. I <laughs> worked at a coffee shop uh, for a little while. And then I worked at, at a camp full time in northern Wisconsin. And I was making like, not money, you know, but it was I was figuring it all out. You know, it's just like, I have no idea. I, I, sp I spent most of my life. I still in this point where I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. But but I, but I'm I'm doing it. And I think kind of goes back to like, you know, making it meaningful. It's like, well, then kind of like, how are you going about doing it? And there were times where I, you know, I was not doing it for the right reasons, or I did it with this like poor attitude, uh, or I was very like self-seeking, self-centered, uh, things I'm very good at, uh, like most human beings, but then to like, to, uh, continue to grow. And then to take maybe some steps back in a positive way to pull back. Maybe I shouldn't say step back, but to pull back and to kind of see life is more than just this, this, and this. There's also this, this, and this as well. And that's, and that's what makes it meaningful. So is that always kind of playing in the back of your mind too? Is like, am I doing, so is this meaningful work? Is what I'm doing meaningful? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that's become my litmus test for how I make decisions in my life. Um, a lot of that was put into play because I, I lost my dad when he turned 50 years old. I was 17. And you know that, that taught me a lot of things, but I guess one of the main things it taught me was that life can be really short and it can be shorter than we think it might be. And often we wait. We wait to pursue our dreams or the things that are meaningful to us when we think there's going to be some point down the line when it's going to be the right time to pursue these things. And so that, I guess, just flipped a switch in my mind that was like, you know, I'm not sure I'm going to wait to pursue the things that I think are meaningful. And so if I feel like living in a van and traveling the country is going to be, if it's going to add meaning to my life, then I'm going to go figure it out and, and I'm going to test it and try it. And so it has, it's become this thing that I try to every day align to and think about is, is what I'm doing adding meaning to my life? And if it's not, what changes do I need to make? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry about your dad. That I hate that for you, man. That sucks. Then, so how do you measure that? How do you measure meaning? I've been working on this relationship that I have to this thing that call it whatever you want, call it the gut, call it intuition, call it your inner sense of knowing, call it 
faith, call it God. I, I think you can, I think people have a lot of different sort of answers to what that sense of knowing or inner peace is. And, uh, I, I've been, I've been learning a lot and trying to develop that relationship within myself of, I think there's, there's a sort of inner sense of knowing that I believe that, that I have that's within me, or maybe it has to do with this, this idea of surrendering, but there seems to be something that I can feel. I don't always think it, but I can feel it in my heart, in my gut, whatever it might be in my body. Somehow I, I just feel like there is a, a feeling, a sense of knowing of what feels right. And so it's been this process of trying to push, push my head and my thoughts out of the way and let some of that intuition and inner sense of knowing guide, guide some of the decisions that I make. It's pretty heavy stuff to move, isn't it? <laughs> the stuff that's in your head. It's taken me uh, many, many years to even make the slightest budge on those things. Yeah. Yeah. Well that, yeah, there's, are you a, are you like, a, are you a feelings guy or like a, like, do you often say like, I think, or I feel I've spent, I'm 29. I've probably spent okay. 28 years of my life. A lot, uh, letting logic be the thing that's my guidepost and making decisions based on logic. Um, but I, I am a feeler. I, I, I feel intensely. I am sensitive and it's taken me many years to sort of come to terms with that and embrace that about myself. So oh, welcome to the club, man. I I, yeah. Yeah. How about that? Then, then <laughs> at least I got someone else in here with me. Uh, so yeah, oh, yeah I we're think, all sink, um, sinking in our own, our own tears. Yeah. I, I would say I am a feeler, but I've, I've long pushed those feelings aside because I've thought that logic is the way that we're supposed to make decisions. What about you? Hmm. Uh, I would say probably the opposite where I've spent most of my life feeling my way through. Uh, and still, still do that, but now learning of like, well, what if we looked at this? What if we started the sentence with, I think instead of, I feel, and what is that going to change? What is that going to do? Not to disregard my feelings or to step away from them. But I think sometimes feelings are, uh, they're not something that we should not, bring with us with us in the car but maybe they shouldn't be the driver uh maybe they should be the passenger i'm not going to stuff them in the trunk uh but they're going to be there and i'm going to hear what they have to say but perhaps there's other wisdom out there that's going to help me uh navigate the journey ahead it's interesting so how did you come to that realization or that conclusion my wife Okay. Uh, I, for a while, I thought everyone just feels like, feels this way. And I, I knew from like an early age, maybe like middle school or high school, and that kind of goes back to, to the whole poetry thing of learning and saying, okay, now everybody's does not feel as intensely as you do, or have as many emotions or funnels their thoughts through the heart rather than the mind, it seems like. Um, and then our first year of marriage. Uh, we kept getting in like these, these same little marriage conversations. And uh, eventually it was just like, oh, you begin, you begin with, I, I think, and I begin with, I feel like I, I come, I lead from a place of feeling and you lead from a place of, of thinking. And so you have everything thought out while I am like kind of feeling my way to the situation. Like, how are you doing? How am I doing? How does this affect us? How does this make us feel rather than logic says this? Uh, and so kind of, taking that and seeing her perspective and approach to things and trying to then apply it to life and work and uh decisions uh it's been a real a real game changer for me but it's like i feel like it's kind of taken my vision from narrow and just widened it just a little bit more hmm. yeah i mean it's it's interesting because as you described the role that logic versus feeling or emotion has played in your life. And, and, and that car analogy, I think is a, is a good one. Um, but what's funny about it is how maybe it's just our, our life experiences or the people around us, how they maybe create a perspective that's different. Because as I heard you describing that, I would say for me, it's probably the exact opposite where I have allowed logic to be the driver. And now I'm trying to allow feeling 
to be the driver mm. and logic can yeah. sort of be in the car around me. So it's, it's kind of interesting yeah. how our life experiences have led us to maybe some different conclusions about the role that each of those should play in our lives. Sure. And I think the, the goal is not, uh, I think the goal is rhythm, right? Like finding a rhythm of, you know, like now is, now is a feeling time. Now is a thinking time. And it's just less playing into that. Uh, not a balance balance is uh, balance is a heart like rhythm like what is the rhythm and then learning to to dance with that as we go through life i i, I like that i tend to find it's an and equation there, mm -hmm. there's a role and a purpose behind both of them and and can be can be the answer mm -hmm. yes yes agree <laughs> what how do you answer the question when people ask you what you do for a living? Uh, it depends on the person. Uh, most of the time, so let's I say, tell them, let's say that I'm asking you, I would probably tell you that I'm a writer because it, it and then it always gets to well, then what do you write? And then I say, well, I write poetry, but I also write stories. And, you know, there's just, there's so many different, I think there's so many different ways to answer it. And I'm still, I still haven't found the right way to answer it. Uh, but if somebody were to ask me and I were to be brutally honest with them, I would say that I am, uh, I'm a writer. I write poetry. I write stories. Um, and then I'm also a speaker and a podcaster and a coach. Like I do all these little things, but, uh, the, I do all these little things to do the main thing. And the main thing is I, I'm a writer. Yeah. It's, uh, well, how are you often met? after you give that response to people <laughs> if i say if i tell people i'm a poet they're like wait really no you're joking because i make a lot of jokes and then they're like here wait that's not true i'm like well no it, it very much is true like I, I i write poetry and i that's what i that's what i share around uh and i was like oh man i always you just kind of you don't strike me as that and then i i share something from the stage and they're like oh all right. So you are, well, I wasn't lying to you, buddy, but you know, uh, so oftentimes it's kind of met with like, there, there, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lean back and then it's a lean in of like, Oh really? Well, tell me more about that. And I'm always happy to, to, to share more about it. Um, I think when you, you know, maybe for yourself, when you say, you know, I'm a podcaster, they're like, well, well, how does that work? You know, it's like, well, we just kind of make it work. That's the kind of the creative way is you just kind of keep, keep doing it and keep giving it what you have and, and seeing if you're going to be able to do it again the next month and the next month and the next month. I, I wonder if there's um, sort of a societal lens that when people hear you say, I'm a writer or I'm a poet, if people are kind of like, well, how, like you can't be, you can't make a <laughs> living doing that. That can't be your real job. You know, it's like, that yeah. can't be how you actually make money or make a living. Yep. Do you feel like people yep. apply that kind of lens when they hear you say that? Oh man, it's nothing. I <laughs> yes, uh, half the time it's like, uh, well, you can stop looking at me with like sympathy. Like I'm, we're making it. We're doing. We're doing it. Like it is a real job. Like it. It there's there's a space for it. A, a lot of it is also uh, helping others to see the importance of perhaps what you do and what you offer to the world. Um, it's hard when you're just in a conversation with somebody and they ask you what you do and you tell them that you're a writer or you're a poet. Now it would be one thing, like if the, if you were like, Oh, I'm a writer and your name is, you know, JK Rowling or, you know, like who, whoever. And they're like, well, yeah, of course you're a writer. But then they look at me and they're like, why, how come I haven't heard of any of your books? And I was like, well, maybe you haven't been looking in the right section. It doesn't mean that they're not there. Like, they are there. I was like, well, I've never heard your stuff before. Well, you've heard of like the top 10 most famous people in the world stuff. I'm not in the top 10, not in the top. I'm not in the top. But like there are still a lot of uh, artists who aren't as big of a name, creatives, writers, poets, podcasters that are still able to do all of the things. It's not just like a it's not just a top heavy thing. Like there's people all the way down and throughout. So I don't know, watching people. Uh, respond to what I when they ask me what I do is is always a gamble. It, I mean, so I used to work in a church too, and so like I I fly around and I go do events and shows, and I'd be sitting next to people on the airplane, and and they'd be like, "So what do you do?" And I was like, "Man, 
this is either going to go like, if I tell them I work at a church, they're like, I'm going to get like three responses, which is like, oh yeah, yeah, I go to church too. Or, oh, that's not for me. Or like uh, some other random response that's just going to be like very awkward and uncomfortable. Or I could tell them that I'm a poet, which will then be like, another awkward response. So I always felt like when I was like, I wasn't ashamed of any of the things that I did, but I was like, I kind of feel bad for this person because what I'm about to tell them is going to shock them. Like what they really want me to tell them is that like, I'm a doctor. Like everyone wants to sit next to a doctor on an airplane. That'd be great. They want me to, maybe I'm a pilot, maybe it's something else, but like a poet or a church worker, man, there's like going to get thrown for a loop and be like, well, I don't really know how to recover from that response. So, <laughs> but it was always a lot of fun. Have you ever just been like, uh, oh, I I sell software for, uh, <laughs> you know, for a tech company? Okay, you know, I I've, I've thought about it before, uh, but I'm I'm not the I'm not the best actor or liar. I would have at some point in the conversation been like, would have mentioned that what I actually do, and lost all credibility. Uh, but maybe one day I might just say, um, today's an acting day. I'm going to try it out. I'm going to learn everything about software engineering without actually learning software engineering. I'm just gonna, like learn. But with my luck, I would sit next to somebody who invented it. And I'd be like, well, I'm actually Mr. Software Engineer. Oh, great. <laughs> cool. Didn't know that was a thing, sir. <laughs> Ma'am, I don't know. You, uh, there was something you had written or maybe I listened to it on your podcast recently. Um, it might've been as you were talking about the story of, of how you got started 11 years ago and you talked about removing the word aspiring in front of whatever it may be. And so that would be, you know, at one time you considered yourself to be an aspiring writer. And then you talk about removing that word for, for our listeners. Can you, can you talk about the thought process behind removing the word aspiring? I think it just, I think it just gets in the way of the the thing that you really want to do when do you stop being an aspiring writer and just start being a writer and i guess we could put that in front of you know aspiring podcaster poet software engineer like whatever it is uh and you just start living into well this is what i do um and so for me, I would call myself an aspiring writer and I would just kind of get hung up on that of like, I'm never going to actually be a writer. It's never going to happen. Meanwhile, I was writing every single day, every single morning, every single night. I was putting words down. I was creating. Um, I was offering those words to other people, my blog, my social media and stuff. And at some point I was just like, you're not like, just, just call yourself a writer. Just kind of like live into that identity, live into that calling and just embrace it. Sure, you may not have a book in a bookstore. You may not, you know, be this published author, but like you're still a writer. And if you're putting words down, you're a writer. And I think for me, as soon as I stopped calling myself an aspiring writer and just started calling myself a writer, I began to approach the the paper or the blank document as myself, not that I not feeling like I had to prove myself or try to make the team of writers. It was no longer a tryout. I was just creating. I was just playing the game. And it was and, and it became the, the the pressure dropped and the fun increased. And I think that's kind of what I was what I was going for. So anytime somebody's like, well, I'm an aspiring writer, my question is, are you are you writing? And they're like, Yeah, all the time. And it's like, well, I think you're a writer. I don't I don't wanna I don't wanna put that on you. Like if you want to carry the word aspiring around, it's very heavy. But I'm letting you know, like if you if you drop it, like your hands are gonna be much more free. So just, just try it. Just, just try calling yourself a writer and see where, what, what kind of goes on from there. It was one of those, those it, this is one of those ideas in my head that I just like can't let go of uh, where I'm like, it just, we don't need that. You don't need that word friend. Like you can just leave it behind and move forward with peace. So. I, I think about how, how powerful it is to make a simple decision. That same coach friend that I, I mentioned earlier, we, we talk about his name's Nate and, and we talk about the idea of, um, we speak in metaphors often and we talk about the idea of like making an operating system update. So all of us as human beings, just like a computer, we, we run on these, on this software, on these operating systems. They're all of our experiences and our beliefs and the things that we've created over time, our identity of, of how we see ourselves. And just like software, at some point you've got to write all this new code and then there has to be a one singular moment where someone pushes a button 
and that new code, the new operating system becomes live one single moment. Like there has to be a definitive one second. It was not live and one second it is. And now it's different. And how I think that's why I really resonated with this idea of dropping the word aspiring, because that is a one singular one second choice that someone can make. And they can just say, you know what? I'm not aspiring. I am a writer. And that one choice can change the way that we see ourselves and change the way that we create and all the things that you led to. And so I just, I think it's a great reminder that, that these things that we want to be and these things that we want to become, well, when? So do you need to just make a simple choice and say that, well, I am those things as of now? Yep. I'm doing it. And like I said, at the very beginning, like anybody can just become a poet, right? Now it's different, like with a software engineer, like, you know, like, yeah. But if you drop that word and kind of live into that freedom, I think everything just kind of begins to change. Kind of like you said, like, at you know, you update the software, you change it, you press the button. There's, there's something different now. What was no longer is what is, is now what we're living into. I, I like that metaphor. That's good. You've, you've talked about your faith and, uh, that's an important part of your life. How does, how does your faith fit into this whole creative picture that we've been talking about? What, what role does it play for you? I, I think it's the, it is the driving, the driving force behind what I do is, is my relationship with God, the things that I believe, and then trying to offer uh, the things that I have come to know to be true to offer them in a way that uh, feels almost like a like a handwritten note slid across the table and tapped twice something that is just like offered of here's the things that I've learned seen felt asked doubted questioned all all those things um, maybe it means something for you as well I'm not in the uh, I'm not in the business of trying to tell others what to, to think or believe. But what I want to do is take the things that I have come to learn and, and to share them in a way. Because I know what it's like to have questions. I know what it's like to wonder or uh, to walk through grief and despair and depression and anxiety and all of the, all of the things. Uh, and then what is the thing that kind of has remained true and steady throughout? Uh, when I read through like the, the the stories of of Jesus and the way in which he uh, cares for people and what he offers the hope that he offers it's something that I want to uh, model after and offer that to others as well uh, and I and I think for me I, it's through poetry it's through stories it's through podcasts it's taking the things that I have come to believe and saying. I know this life is heavy and hard and not the way that you want it to be, uh, but good is on the way. And that's kind of where I end up. I don't have the answers, uh, but I have hope. Is that the thing that you find yourself wanting to bring into the world? You know, we, we talked earlier in this conversation, you made the comment about how it feels like as creators, we want to bring into the world something that we feel like is missing. Is that, is, is hope that thing for you? Uh, I would, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, and I would say the, the way in which it is, is brought forward, right? Like the, uh, the vessel in which, uh, I share hope, which is through poetry and stories and live events. Um, my, the hope, the hope in the prayer is when I, when I, when I do events or speak at schools or even share things on the internet that people would, would leave feeling more hopeful than when they entered the venue or opened up their, their app or whatever it may be, uh, that they would, that they would get this sense and remember that everything is okay. Even if everything isn't okay in the, in, in that moment, um, that something more is happening than we can see that we are not a forgotten people. Uh, and that good is is on the way. Um, you know, as you were talking about, you know, the uh, the changing of the code and uh, this new like new uploading thing. All I thought about was like rest was like getting away, like you know, uh, 
like to Sabbath to to pull away for one day a week where you're not you're not working or you're not like ah, I almost said the word grinding and I absolutely hate the word grinding but now I've said it like three Same. times <laughs> you know it's, it's it's just like an icky like I just don't I don't but where you're just like working and you're trying and you're doing and you're doing and instead you can just kind of you can just rest and breathe and be and surrender and all of these things and I feel like that changes the code that changes then how you kind of enter back into the week of where you can kind of let go, exhale, and look back and, and see how God has been faithful. And yes, how life has been hard, but how uh, sins are forgiven and you have been refreshed. Grace has met you. Mercy is new. And now we get to step forward on that foot rather than the tired foot from the day before and, and so that that's kind of what i want to invite people into and and, and this i i think for me uh growing up i when i was in church like the only thing that i really seemed to connect with there were two things it was like the stories during a sermon and then if like if a psalm was being read there's something about the psalms that i was like oh those are dark a little angsty, very full of emotion. I know somebody just like that, <laughs> you know, and then like the, the stories of like, oh, that's, that's a good way to think about it. And I think poetry kind of does that. It's not a sermon. It's not a song, but it's kind of somewhere in between. And if you read my poetry or attend one of my events, it's, you're going to, you're going to hear stories and you're going to hear poems. And hopefully those, uh, those point you to something greater than the one who is sharing them. Uh, but also reminds you that hope is real and it's for you. You talk about rest. Have you always had that relationship to the idea of rest? Oh, no. Oh, absolutely not, man. You can't you can't have a good relationship with something uh, right away. No, that's not how it works. Uh, I was terrible at rest. I was, go back to that G word, it was always, I was always, I was just always trying. You know, those first couple of years of wanting to be a poet, it was like, it was unhealthy. I seemed to kind of obsess over it of like wanting to be where I wasn't, of wanting to be somebody that I was not yet, of wanting to have uh, like an area to share my words, but I wasn't, I wasn't ready for any of those things. Uh, there was just a lot of wrestling. There was no rest. I was always trying to get to the next thing or write the thing or do the thing. And I think, you know, if I could go back and do it all again, I would just go slow. Instead of trying to run and wrestle my way forward, I would just take these small, slow steps. And eventually it, it got to that point where I was like, you are just spinning the tires, man. Like, what if you just kind of took it one day, one prayer, one breath at a time? Um, instead of trying to skip ahead to the good thing, because you're missing a lot of the good stuff that's right in front of you. Uh, we can't, because we can't, you know, we can't skip ahead. You can't skip ahead to the 50th episode, 100th episode, 200th episode. You got to take it one at a time and make mistakes and invite people like on me to the podcast, you know, like you have to do to get to where you really want to go. But, you know, it's like the, you know, the, it's all about the journey of figuring it all out of, uh, cause you can't, you can't build muscle without working out, you know, can't make bread without working the dough. And this is, this is what we're doing. Did that make and building sense? that it, it does. And building that okay. relationship to rest and to going slow into all of those things, I find to be a forever journey as well, because I can sit here and nod and be like, yes, I know I've got to do one at a time. And like, I, I totally agree. And then tomorrow I'm probably going to, you know, be freaking out to my wife and be like, ah, why am I not hundred steps down the road? And you know, that's a forever yep. journey and it ebbs and flows. So I feel like just a, a reminder for anyone listening to this, that it's not like we have all these things figured out as well. We're, we're forever constantly sort of struggling with them and trying to work mm -hmm. on our relationship to these things. And, and I think it is important, like alongside of rest, to take a moment to kind of look back and see, see like what's happened along the way, the steps that you've taken 
the the good things, the bad things, the things that you've learned. But if we're always like focused on, oh, we're not there yet, we're not there yet. What have you been through? Because at one point you weren't where you are now. So what are the things that you've lived through, you've gone through, you've you've learned? And then what are those things that you can celebrate? I, I think we're we're pretty bad at celebrating the things that we've achieved and done. And it's not about, it's not about us. It's like, I, I, it's like, it's not about like becoming something, growing yourself. It's not that, but it is like, it's okay to be proud of the fact that you started a podcast. You had this person on, you know, you know, this person sent you a message about how this episode meant something to you. I like remembering the things that are meaningful matter. It's a reminder that I need very often. I mean, it's one of the reasons I, I have these conversations is, is in some ways, you know, these conversations become like a, a therapy session for me. And often my guests share things that I need and vice versa. And, and I learn from people. And I think that's been the most meaningful and fulfilling part of this particular journey in my life is that, yeah, just it, it brings things about for me that I need. And I often find myself ending the recording of a conversation like this, and we haven't even pushed publish or shared it with one single person. And yet I feel like I've gained something for my life, for my day, for my journey. And so, yeah, I, that's why, as we, as we talked about in the beginning, before we started recording, I'm just, I'm grateful to people like you for entering into this very vague, undefined vessel <laughs> that I have created. and in in trusting that we can have a conversation that's going to bring about something that people need to hear. So thank you for doing that. I want to also, as we do wrap up our conversation, um, we'll, we'll see how this goes. This is going to be a compliment, but it's going to start with a question. Are you familiar? Uh, do you read anything by Frederick Backman? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, Maybe he's someone that you could check out. So he, he's a writer and uh, he's, yeah. he's probably, I would say, my favorite author in his books. What I really enjoy about them is he has this way of just sort of articulating the human condition and the human experience that I really enjoy and resonate with. And I want to tell you that as I have been reading some of your your writing, preparing for this conversation, I found myself thinking of of him and I really admire the way that you can share these small little things that bring people into your stories and into your writing and describe sort of the human condition. Uh, little things like uh, your your story of of being at the diner waiting for your friend and you know you had little sentences in there that were just like breakfast is getting really expensive and um you know you, you came back it, to that a couple it times is. or yeah, or well, it is. It definitely is. Or, or the line about, you know, the father and daughter next to you and knowing that they were vegans because that was all that they talked about. You know, these little <laughs> things um, or, or the, the, the story about your your 11 year journey and second guessing yourself and trying to figure out, you know, was it a bathtub or was it a shower? I, those little things to me, I yeah. just think do such a good job of sort of describing the human experience or condition and, and making relatability as I can be like, Oh, you know, this is just a fellow human being writing this and describing the things that yeah. we all go through as humans. And so I wanted to share that with you that I really admire that Thank you. about your writing. And um, it reminded me of an author that I really enjoy and have learned a lot from and hold in very high regard. So I wanted to share that with you. Well, thank you. That, that means a lot. It's always uh, flattering when somebody says you, you wrote something and I remember it, you know, like, it's just, it's just nice. So thanks for, his name was Frederick Backman. Frederick Backman. Yeah. I'm going to look it up, look him up. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you after our conversation. Maybe I'll, I'll send you a couple of, of my favorites by him, but um, I've just been on a kick reading pretty much all his books and yeah, he just has these way of just like you, these little one liners that, that just sort of hit home, they hit to the heart and they feel like they capture the essence of, what we're all experiencing as human beings. And I think that's maybe sometimes the most powerful thing about writing. Um, Tanner, if, if people cool. want to find you, find more about your writing, if they want to read some of your poetry, where can they go to, to find you? Yeah, you can visit written to speak.com. 
uh, W R I T T E N T O S P E A K. Uh, and then all of my links are on there. Uh, I also have a sub stack. I, I, I put a lot of things on Instagram. I still do the Facebook game. So I'm still there. Uh, but I post a lot of writings and short thoughts, uh, stories, poems, prayers, videos. Yeah. And I also have uh, four books of, of poetry that are out. And I have two more books on the way over the next like, two years. I'll have two more books come out. So exciting. Good for you. Well, I'll include some of those links in the show notes of this episode. Thank you you for, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing some of your story. Thank you for the writing that you do and the ways that you communicate. And thank you for, you know, this mission of putting more hope into the world. I think it's a noble one and uh, I look forward to seeing how it continues to unfold. So thank you. Well, thanks for having me on this. This was, uh, I get to do a lot of podcasts. This one was, I had a lot of fun with this one. I wish that we could have done it sitting across the table from each other, but uh, Zoom will have to do. Next time. Next time. Yes. Yes, please. Hey, thanks for getting to this point of the episode with me. Before you go, I want to invite you to come over to Instagram on my Instagram profile at Chad M. Miles on Instagram. I make a post every week with an, the cover image of each of these episodes. And on it, it's an invitation to... Come be part of the discussion. Come share some of your thoughts. Uh, Is there anything about the episode that stood out to you? And connect with other listeners. Think of it as kind of like a forum for this podcast. And find some other like-minded people. So if you listened, if you have some thoughts, come on over to Instagram and share some of those. Also in the description of this show are some links to find Tanner's work and a link to a platform called Buy Me A Coffee, which is about what it sounds like. It's a way for you to support this small, independent podcast that I run in a financial way. And if you found that you've gained something from these conversations, that small financial tip to buy me a coffee to support some late night editing sessions or recording sessions, we very much appreciate it as it helps me keep this show and these conversations going, which I feel like is meaningful. And frankly, I'm going to keep it going no matter what, but your contributions really help. Okay. That's all I've got for this week and see you next time.